I had one job. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> to hit the record button. <laughs> I'll just All the right, we'll I'm starting from the top. Yeah. <laughs> that was our dress rehearsal. <laughs> Welcome everybody to episode 21 of Feedback Friday. Uh, I'm Kathy Hottori from Botanical Colors and joining me is Amy Dufo from her kitchen in Cape Cod. I'm based in Seattle where we have both an online natural dye company as well as a custom dye service. Um, we love to talk to everybody that we possibly can find about natural dyes. So we've spoken with scholars, artists, students, um, just about activists, anyone that we could track down that we think might be interesting and present them to you. So today our uh, presentation is two amazing artists slash activists, Jamie Bourgeois and Madeline McGarrity. Um, they are using matter root, so it's the um, Rubia tinctorum variety. So it's more of the Turkish and Iranian matter as opposed to the Indian matter. And they're using this particular natural dye in order to understand the composition of uh, water sources. So Jamie is focusing on the possible presence of toxic, toxic contaminants that she took water samples from Louisiana's Cancer Alley. And so that's a 150 mile stretch of the Mississippi River that has been, um, it it's, has notoriety, I suppose is the best word to use, notoriety for, notoriety for both pollution levels and high cancer rates and uh, the impacts to both the color and the communities that are within these this 150 mile stretch. Um, Madeline is focusing on the impact of water composition on mordant print quality and clarity. So she was seeking <clears throat> to isolate the best mordant color development as well as the clarity of printing. Uh, Madeline's a professional printer, so this is a really interesting uh, analysis and I'm really excited to look at that. Um, and so she's trying to develop a circular system of printing textile yardage with natural dyes to get the best effects, uh, least impact. So we're looking at external impacts and also this really detailed inquiry into how to, how to really hone in on the best uh, variables to create great printing. And it's gonna be an amazing presentation. So before we start, I just wanna say thank you I'm going to say thank you a lot, but thank you in advance and thank you during and thank you after. Um, we could not do this without you and your absolute enthusiasm and willingness to participate in a brand new medium that none of us had ever used really before. And so we're really excited to be continuing to present all of these different artists and um, fascinating people to you. So thank you. Um, so just a little housekeeping, Amy is going to be managing the chat and um, once the presentation is over, then Amy will open it up and you can ask questions. We did have a few questions come in before, but don't be shy, uh, ask away and then we will answer as many as we can with the time that we have. And then after that, um, if both Jamie and Madeline have the time, they'll also answer additional questions. So, anything else, Amy? Um, we've it's been pointed out that it's the 21st, and this is our 21st episode. Oh my goodness! I don't is even that know that cosmic or what. Don't even know what is going to happen. So, okay. buckle up. So we're on the cusp of what? Leo and Virgo madness. Well, yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so thank you, Amy, and take it away, Jamie and Madeline. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I want to say thank you to everyone for being here, and thank you to Botanical Colors um, for putting on these Feedback Fridays every week. Um, I look forward to them all the time. See, I'm going to try to share my screen with you. Let's see see before I get started hmm. here we go so 
My presentation uh, today is going to be about my ongoing investigation of water quality in Cancer Alley uh, using Matter Root as a vehicle. Uh, for this project, I wanted to see if I could use natural dyes to detect different contaminants in the water of this particularly uh, polluted region. Cancer Alley is the uh, 150 mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge in Louisiana along the Mississippi River. There's a very high concentration of petrochemical plants uh, mixed in with uh, communities. Um, and because of this, there's an elevated uh, risk of cancer in this region. And as you can see from this map, there are a lot of chemicals, some really toxic chemicals that are both manufactured um, and uh, emitted into the atmosphere and the landscape uh, in this region. Let's see. Uh, so um, for this project, I collected surface water samples from various bodies of water, uh, including lakes, rivers, bayous, swamps, all areas that I have found that are um, direct dumping grounds for uh, discharge from these plants, or are at least connected to one, because a lot of the water systems in Louisiana are all very connected. And I use these water samples to create matter dye baths. Um, and here's a map of all of my collection sites. I've done two rounds so far, um, both a couple months apart from one another. Um, and when I originally started this project, I thought about using a dye plant that I could actually harvest directly from the Louisiana landscape. Oh. But after talking to um, my good friend, Erica Molnar, who's been such a great help uh, for me on this project, as well as in my dye practice in general, I decided to use um, matter root for a couple of different reasons. Um, matter root contains a very high concentration of uh, dye compounds that can result in many colors, um, ranging from a true red to orange, uh, purples, browns, all depending on what's in the water as well as how you're processing the matter. And I knew that I wanted to keep doing these uh, tests over time. So I needed to have access to a dye plant um, at any point. And uh, so I ended up buying a um, sort of a large container of ground rubia tinctorum that I could uh, use each time. And I knew I was getting the same quality and from the same source of dye every single time. Sometimes my slides stick. Let's see. <laughs> um, too far. Um, so uh, before I added the matter root to these water samples, I used water quality test strips that I purchased online to test for a number of different things, just so I had something a little more concrete that I can compare my dye results to. Um, and I also want to point out that um, within each round, I also did a control test uh, where I used distilled water as my base. Um, so the dye procedure sort of went like this. After I collected all of my water samples um, and tested them with the test strips, I added a half a tablespoon of ground rubia tinctura to each jar and allowed it to rest overnight. Um, and then the fabric samples that I decided to use, I used uh, four swatches um, uh, in two different fiber contents. So I used a uh, silk habitat and I used a cotton. And then one of each I left unmordanted and one of each I mordanted with an, alumin, uh, an alum mordant. And then when I was ready to start my dye process, I put um, the dye bath, which was the water sample, now with matter, I'm calling the dye bath. Um, in a stainless steel pot, I added all four of my fabric uh, swatches, and then I slowly rose the temperature over an hour, careful not to boil, and then at that hour mark, I did do a rolling simmer for 10 minutes, and then I rinsed my samples um, in tap water and I allowed them to dry. And these are all of my results from round one and round two. And I'm still doing, I was trying to like, piece the puzzle together and sort of figure out what's going on here. But I have found that I have a couple of things that I need to look more into. And those are the um, geology of the natural landscape 
in this area um, and to sort of see what would be in these waterways uh, without any pollution or uh, human interaction. Um, and then I'm also looking at the pollution um, that is um, emitted and discharged from these different plants in the area. And then third, sort of within both, I'm really interested in how, um, what the pH, um, hardness and softness and uh, total alkalinity is within each, because I think this uh, is sort of what is gonna be manipulating my fabrics most, um, that and um, also any presence of uh, different metal salts. And you can sort of see here that there are sort of two different sort of groupings that I've found. There are the pieces that died um, much darker throughout, and then the pieces that died a little bit lighter throughout. And then I have two outliers, both of the B samples. Um, and here, my next slide, I sort of grouped together the, um, the two sort of groups that I was just talking about, and I compared them to the water quality set, uh, uh, samples that I got. Um, and I've noticed that the pieces that died much lighter throughout had a slightly higher pH and uh, recorded some kind of alkalinity, whereas all of the samples that had that died much darker throughout um, didn't record any alkalinity except for D2, which was an outlier uh, in this set. And then um, all of them had a um, slightly more acidic pH. So in order for me to um, better read all of my dye results, I decided to do um, another round of testing, uh, what I called my control test, where I used distilled water as the base of all of these um, dye samples. And then I included different substances that I thought could be reacting or manipulating my dye results from my water samples. So, I included things that would manipulate the pH, the hardness and softness, as well as the alkalinity. But I also included a couple things that I thought could be in the water, like tannin or aluminum, ferrous. Um, I also included um, a source for phosphorus and I included um, miracle Grow, um, some synthetic fertilizer, because there are uh, two synthetic fertilizer plants um, on the Mississippi River near where I collected my water samples. Um, and here are all of my results uh, so far. And I could spend so much time uh, talking about comparisons and sort of what I think is happening, um, but that would take up um, more than a day, I feel like. So I've actually just selected two comparisons that I, um, I wanted to focus on today. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, I am comparing the chalk control uh, tests that I did with one of my Mississippi uh, River samples. And as you can see, the water quality um, values below are nearly identical, but the dye results are not. So I think that's pretty interesting and something to dive more into. And then on the right hand side um, are two Mississippi River samples that I took um, that I collected just one day apart from one another um, near um, a very, the mostly about the same point of the river, just um, on opposite banks. And you can see that the dye results and the values are different. Um, and I would think that they would actually be the same since it's the same source of water. But um, right above F2, there is one of those synthetic fertilizer plants that's just right up river. So um, I think that the value in this project is going to be for me to continue doing these tests, not only to, to test new places, um, but also to keep testing the same spots over and over again to see how the dye results uh, change over time. Um, I spoke with an environmental scientist over um, the last weekend, and he told me that the industry motto is uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. Um, I know that uh, these plants are emitting toxic chemicals into the waterways and into the air because the public has access to all of their air and water permits. We also have access to their discharge monitoring permits, their accident reports, and the EPA's toxics release inventory. And um, I would encourage everyone to look at the toxics release inventory uh, tool on the EPA's website whenever you get a chance. 
Um, so, you know, what I don't know is that if these specifically toxic chemicals that I'm seeing in these permits um, would even have an effect on a matter root dye bath. Um, I don't know if like radium-226 will shift the color of matter root, or if diachlorobenzene will sadden colors, or if sulfuric acid will actually brighten them. I don't know if mercury captures particles like other metal salts, or if other endocrine disruptors like lead, dioxin, and arsenic will increase uh, dye absorption or manipulate a matter dye bath in some other way. Um, but, If I can get to my last slide. <laughs> um, what I do know um, is that Cancer Alley is seeing an, an expansion in uh, chemical plants coming into the region. In 2014, the St. James Parish uh, Council voted to change the um, land use plan in the fifth district, which is a predominantly um, black community from residential to residential future industrial without getting the consent of the residents in the area. And this has invited industry to just come on in. You can see all of these darker pink areas are all new plants coming in and all of the lavender are existing facilities in the area. There are two um, on the ground uh, activist organizations, Rise St. James and the Louisiana Bucket Brigade who are working to fight both the uh, state and local governments against the construction of a new uh, plastic plant called Formosa. It's um, a 14 complex um, plastics plant that will uh, double the amount of toxic air pollution in the, in the parish. Um, it will emit 800 tons of toxic pollution every year. The plant will displace and destroy over 100 acres of wetlands. It is going to be built on top of newly discovered grave sites of enslaved people and is going to be located just one mile from an elementary school. But the danger doesn't just stop in St. James Parish, even though it is very dangerous for those residents. On an alarmingly warming planet, Formosa will constitute the largest new source of greenhouse gases from a United States petrochemical complex since 2012. The complex will release 13 million tons of carbon pollution each year, not to mention its sole purpose is to make single-use plastics, which is something we just don't need more of. Um, so with the close of my presentation, I really urge all of you and ask you to please consider supporting both of these organizations, spreading the word about Cancer Alley, and signing their petition to stop Formosa. Thank you. Jamie, thank you. That was amazing, beautiful, and just so sobering to hear about the issues with um, the Formosa plant um, and the fact that it's being just built with total disregard for pretty much anything, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No regard for the planet, no regard, of course, for the, the residents and the area. Um, they obviously got a great deal from the, either the local government and or the state of Louisiana. Um, we will have all of that information uh, in the blog post as well as um, Amy sends around uh, an email with all the links to the video. And yeah, I totally encourage you to become informed. There is quite possibly something similar happening in your own community. So having us be aware of what's being constructed and why, uh, I think is super important in this day and age. Um, since almost 70 of the um, top 100 EPA regulations that have been designed to kind of keep us safe have been rolled back in, the, in this administration. So. I think it's really up to us as um, citizen activists to become better informed about this. All right, um, Amy, any, we're gonna hold questions until um, after Madeline's presentation, that's correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to Madeline McGarrity, and she's going to go through an amazing presentation about um, her inquiry into water quality. Thanks again, Jamie. Um, hey everybody, I'm Madeline. Um, 
I, uh, I'm going to jump right in and sort of show you some samples that I did for this specific test. Um, I can sort of wax on by accident about all this stuff just because I've read so many books and I'm like so deep in these tests right now. So I'm going to do like some broad strokes, just the tests, then how the tests are relating to the project and the project itself. Um, I'm really happy to take detailed questions and question and answer sessions. Um, and frankly, like if you want to nerd out, I'm going to post the whole thing on my site, like an article about it on Sunday with all of the like numbers and the percentages and exactly how I did all these tests. Um, I'll give you a little overview here, but honestly, there just wouldn't be enough time for all the deets. So I'm just going to jump into this presentation so you can see some of these examples and then explain how they relate to the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, here are some examples of tests that are disasters. Um, earlier on in the sort of like building up to testing all of these things, I was having a lot of problems and I couldn't figure them out. And luckily I stumbled on uh, the first part of Jamie's sort of testing with water. And I saw the huge difference that she got between all of these sort of different water samples and realized just, um, just sort of how sensitive matter can really be. Um, it's always sort of been my die nemesis. Like it never worked for me the way I wanted it to before. And I sort of assumed that that's like where I was gonna top out. This is just a selection of sort of like prints that haven't gathered color very well, prints that didn't print well. And like, this is just what I was getting for a very long time. Um, so I decided to start testing water that was around where I was around, like close by. And you can see the huge difference here between tap water and the tap water where I live is like really hard, very hard, very neutral um, pH, which I thought was desirable. But turns out that rainwater, which is a pH of like 4.5, at least where I live, um, is obviously just gives a much more vibrant red. I use Sally Fox's Fox Fiber here. It's a uh, cotton that grows with a color and the colored like cotton part of the weave gathers color so much more vibrantly than the white cotton. Um, she, expl she, she explained it to me once. It's complex sort of chemistry of how the, the colored cotton gathers color from natural dyes a little bit more than white cotton. Um, feel free to go to her site and check out her awesome textiles. So here's the first run of test prints that I did. Um, just a little word about the process. Um, for, I used 100% weight of matter to fabric um, if it was a print because I figure it's about 50% coverage and like that's sort of how you run prints and you decide how much you're gonna use. Um, if I put the later tests, I added some other um, sort of samples to, and if there were flat color samples, I upped it to like 150 if there were a couple of flat color samples, or 200 if I thought there were more flat color than not. Uh, but you can see how the tap water really gathers a background tone and doesn't gather a dye very well, and the lake water does the opposite. It really has a totally clear background and has done a much better job color wise. Like it even, the tap water even repelled the iron print, which is usually this sort of like ballistic print where it's really hard to mess it up. Um, so I'm just gonna go through, you can see it closer here, the gathering in the background and not, and it's dehumidifier water and river water. Um, tap water with hardness, this hardness sort of blocks it and gathers color and I found that waters with high organic content in them, like organic matter content, also perform the same way, though the river water isn't really hard at all. It's a soft water source. These are the winners of all the tests I've done so far. Um, two different types of rainwater and a dehumidifier water. Uh, the dehumidifier water, frankly, works very similarly to uh, distilled water. 
it's just sort of a dead water. It doesn't have anything going on. Um, the rainwater, the unaltered is uh, that I collected it like out in the open and the altered is that it came off my roof and my roof is, you know, full of leaves and stuff. So it has a little bit of organic matter in it. Um, I might get out, there we go. Um, so this is just a little bit closer, a little bit of a closer spread so you can see them better. And I also made a little chart, mine's a little bit less technical than Jamie's, um, but I have a couple different water testing things. I had this 16 in one test and frankly, a lot of it came out as nothing because half of the things you're testing in a 16 in one test are like for pools or whatever. So I didn't include that. And then I had hydrion and pH and hardness test strips because they were a little bit more sensitive. Um, in future tests, I'll be, I will be testing distilled water. I know that there was a question about that um, in the questions that people sort of sent in for us. Um, distilled water is obviously great for dyeing with natural dyes. It's just that um, because it has to get made, I don't really consider it to be a viable part of a sustainable printing system, just because either you have to get it delivered to you, um, which involves cars and plastic bottles and blah, blah, blah. But also like, you know, you could buy a system to distill your own water. They're just prohibitively expensive for a small business and, you know, run on electricity and sort of ruin the circularity of a possibly very sustainable system. Uh, and I, I just feel like a shop could really get along with a mixture of sort of like collected rainwater and dehumidifier water because you're going to have to dehumidify the studio anyway to get crisp prints or like reliable prints. It's just the way it is. Um, obviously, if you were running a studio in like Arizona or something, dehumidifier water would not really be an option, nor would rainwater. Um, so some of the future tests I'm doing are to um, manually soften water. There's a way that you can mix in like lime and or lime and soda ash to try to precipitate metal salts out of water. And perhaps that would work for shops in drier areas. I'm I don't want to postulate whether or not it works because I haven't frankly tried it yet. Um, but those are some of the future tests I'm doing. I'm going to do a test with Bran too because of some of the things that Jamie found in her tests. And I have a test going on right now with seawater and Epsom salt also because Jamie found that salt has sort of like an impressive outcome. And I'm curious what it might be like with prints. When we talked on Tuesday, Kathy said that uh, the phosphates and bran make it like sort of like not disposable in a way, you know, like you, you can't just use tons of phosphates and water and then get rid of it somehow, but I'm just going to test it out to see how it goes. Um, I'm going to take you down off this thing real quick. Stop share. Yeah. So uh, the premise of this project is really to create a simple, really accessible pro like system for printing with natural dyes. Um, I'm not trying to like revolutionize printing with natural dyes. I'm just trying to make it accessible either for professional printers or professional dyers who are interested in being able to produce production yardage. You know, yardage is where somebody else sends you a pattern and you can produce that pattern. And in my mind for that, you really need um, a recognizable color matching system. So I'm going through the sort of like royalty of natural dyes, the dyes that are, you know, understood to be extremely permanent pack a real punch, um, you know, like indigo are helpful in conserving water because that is definitely uh, the big complaint with natural dyes is the water usage. So to find a way to do it sustainably, you have to find a way to make the water usage less or a way to process it better. So which is what I'd be working on in the second part of the project. The part I'm in now is just making sure that all the colors are possible and that you can mix them together, which is going to be a challenge in itself. Since obviously some dyes like a high pH, some like a low, some like additives that the other ones really don't like. Um, I don't know, it's really, really interesting. So I'm happy to take any questions about it. I just, uh, I'm really excited the way that sort of an, the fiber and textile community in America is sort of working towards this ability to be able to produce 
US made textiles, like the fiber shed idea, where there's just lots of little businesses working as an ecosystem, because I mean, little businesses anyway, really support each other, but it'd be amazing to be able to do the whole, the whole spread of, you know, growing, weaving, sort of like dyeing and printing and finishing in America as a small sustainable system. Um, not because I think it'll like take the place of all the corporate structures we already have, but just as a nice alternative to that and a way to sort of become better. Um, that's all. I'm really, really looking forward to questions and answers because I just, I don't know, I'm really excited about it. So I'm well, done. I'm ready for questions and answers. <laughs> I, I opened up chat. I almost don't want to say it because suddenly it's just going to go, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, but we do have some questions we can jump into, but uh, Madeline, thanks so much for. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for everybody coming too. Yeah, I know. Um, and I did, that's interesting that you know Erica Molnar. I, we'll have to talk about that after. Um, but one of the things I do love that what, what you're doing is trying to find some way to, to access water with your practice. And I love the fact that you've been using that dehumidifier water. <laughs> and imagine like if we had some kind of a space where we had massive dehumidifiers, the likes of which we've never seen, that is taking that water will be really interesting. I'm sure they already exist, right? They probably do. They, we just need to find out how to use them for natural dye practices. It, I think. It'll be thrilling. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm just going to jump into, I have some questions that came in through email. And uh, so the first one, do you monitor the matter? I think that this is, either one of you can, either one of you feel free to answer this. Do you monitor the matter that you are using and always use from the same producer or soil type? Um, I get all my matter from Stony Creek Colors. Um, just, it was where I could find ground Rubia tinctorum when I started this. And so I have like a huge bag. So yes. Same, I purchased a, a large quantity of uh, ground Rubia tinctorum and I'm using the same, the same, from the same jar. Oh wow, all right. So it's just kind of the, what the water's gonna do to it. So that's your consistent is the, the type mm -hmm. of matter that you're using. Okay, let's just jump over here to, are you printing your mordant or printing the dye? Right now I'm printing mordants. I, in the future I'll be doing direct application, but to me they're two really different processes. Mm -hmm. And the mordant prints really, uh, you know, they're well known for being much more permanent and gathering more vibrant color. And they seem more complicated, honestly. So I thought it'd be better to start with them. So and get frustrated later. <laughs> Jamie. Um, Jamie how, so Michelle Glass is asking, how do you stay safe when, when you're working with toxic water? Which is a good question. Yeah, I, you know, I honestly didn't think about that when I was first doing them. And it was raining the first day that I decided to do these tests. And I did it in my kitchen with the window open and the vent on. And then I realized when I was doing my second round, um, and especially when I did my control round, uh, when I decided to use miracle Grow, that um, I probably should do it outside and wear a respirator. But I did contact, I do not think that anyone should put miracle Grow in a dye pot. I can't, but I contacted three different um, chemists who said that my one fourth of a teaspoon in my bath uh, shouldn't blow me up and it didn't, so. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't blow you up because you didn't here <laughs> right now to answer questions. <laughs> So um, what tools would you both suggest to have to start performing tests? If, you, if somebody was using their own local water, what, what's a kind of first step you would suggest if somebody wants to start doing this on their own, do it, you know, looking at pollution or looking at what's in the water? I would say definitely mason jars. Um, and then I also did, if you want to sort of be able to pinpoint where you're getting all of your, um, samples from. I also took the longitude and latitude with my smartphone, just did a screenshot wherever I was standing. Um, and then um, I think some good water quality test strips, uh, which I'm still uh, searching for the best ones. So if anybody has um, any ideas on what the best water quality test strips are, I think those are good. Um, and then your dye source um, pots, those things. Yeah. Um, I'd say 
pretty much the same. I do, I run tests in big mason jars, like the ball jars, sort of, the canning jars. And I put them in a ring inside of a huge pot so that when I do these runs of tests, I know that not only are all the tests done the same way, there's the same controls in this one run, but that the heat and the, you know, the way that they're actually physically dyed are all exactly the same. So I don't have to worry that, you know, I walked away for a second and totally forgot about what I was doing. And one of them got, you know, dyed for like five hours and one got dyed for three or something, because that is something that I sometimes do. But definitely the water test strips. I have the same problem where like the ones that I use, I just don't feel like they're sensitive enough. Like I know for a fact there's iron in my water, but it never shows up. And I don't understand why. I mean, I guess because they're for a pool, I actually brought them in case these guys, I don't know. They're good, but it's like this amount to, of stuff to read and half of it shows up as zero every time I do it. So better water quality test strips and to just test it right before. Mm -hmm. Shameless botanical colors plug. We sell pH strips. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's interested, <laughs> Kathy. Yeah, okay. but they don't. They don't. Um, they don't look at the actual chemical content of what's in the water. It only just gives you not only, but it gives you a pH reading. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Jamie, curious if you tested the water after dying. I did do a uh, pH of the water, uh, of the, um, the after baths, and the pH dropped. Uh, but then I spoke with Madeline actually about this, and she said that matter itself actually has a lower pH and will bring down the bath. So I don't know if it was sort of um, the um, action of heating that lowered the pH, or if it was a combination of that and the matter root bringing it down. Yeah, I test mine. Um after I've soaked the extract for like, I usually do it for a couple of days and one of them in the fridge, um, just because I don't want it to like ferment and it totally would. Um, but I, to it, I was doing in the beginning, I was doing a test and without fail, the matter itself lowered the pH of the bath by like one, one and a half marks, which like if pH, when a pH like drop, like increases or drops one tick is like, it's a huge jump, you know, it's not, it's not nothing. So it does like lower it slightly, but honestly, I think we both found in our tests that a lower pH results on cotton and linen, at least in like a much better tone, mm -hmm. um, like more vibrant, more red. I got better clearing with lower pH waters. And silk, silk also for me in the lower pH um, also gave me darker reds or reds. I feel like silk just loves to take way more color on than most fibers. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go back over to a question somebody sent in. Do you monitor all the minerals that are in that report? So I don't know what that report is. I mean both I, of you have but. I, I think they might be talking about uh, the um, the permits and so I've spent hours just scrolling through permits and half of the information I barely understand but I am talking with some environmental scientists right now who might be able to help me sort of read these a little bit better um, so I am trying to sort of see um, what is being emitted per their reports and um, what it what it could be doing to the water in terms of uh, pH, hardness and softness and alkalinity. Um, so I am, I am working on that. All right. Um, you know, somebody brought up a good point here that I know you're using Sally Fox's cotton and Sally mm -hmm. Fox is part of the fiber shed in, in Northern California and there are fires burning right now. And so Helen Kennedy is asking us to sort of just kind of keep that in mind, all those fiber shed people out there that are going through a lot and including Sally Fox, who you can follow her right now and see the madness that is her farm right now with the forest fires uh, or the fires. Um, lots of great examples here in the chat of how to get water and using, you know, different types of water. Um, just going through lots of good comments. Like somebody's here from the Netloft, Kathy, from Cordova. <laughs> 
Um, okay, Katie, Kaplan, Madeline, I'm really impressed by the strong white in your unmordanted areas. I saw on your Instagram, you do finishing baths to remove some of the pink from those areas. What method is that? Um, I do a bran bath with a little bit of synthropol. I guess I use prosopol, the sort of um, sustainable, more alcohol-free version of synthropol because synthropol has a kind of high alcohol content. And that's just like a neutral pH textile processing thing I get from uh, ProChem. But um, that's ProChemical and dye, sorry. <laughs> that's like their whole name. But um, it's also, the, the background is interesting because before, so when, after I've soaked the matter, before I put the textile in, and make sure that it's like 75 or 80 degrees. I wait for it to all come down. That's made a huge difference in how well the prints take color and how well the background clears. I don't know why, I, maybe I'll find out. But um, it's also that I add, I take a cup of the dye out and I add an equal parts calcium carbonate and gallotannin, mix it in, put it back in. Somehow it doesn't gather color on the background, even with the addition of tannin, but that has been a huge help in actually producing the white background. And I get very clear backgrounds on the sort of black and white prints that I do as well, which also involve gallo tannin, like in a similar way. Um, so, I mean, the thing, the thing is that, one of the things I saw about the water tests is that if you want a clear background, and you don't use the right water, there is absolutely no way you're getting it. Like, if you don't use sort of like dead water to begin with, like rainwater or distilled water or like dehumidifier water, you can process that at the end however much you want, and it is never going to clear because it's just on there. It's on there the same way that dyes on there. Hmm. But that's how I get the really clear backgrounds, the water. Somebody was asking, and talking about the water and kind of temperatures, they were asking if the water temperatures alter, well, maybe I'm putting it the way I think it is, but does the temperature requirement alter with a different type of water? I mean, I made sure to do all the temperatures all the same as part of the control. Okay. Same. So no, for yeah. me. I mean, maybe in the future you'd find out that, but not with these tests. Mm -hmm. Have, I guess either one of you can answer this. Are there any tips on reducing the amount of water on scouring, mordanting, and then dyeing? Do you, do you use exhausted mordants? What is the best way to dispose of them? Lots of questions in there, but maybe focus on the water part where some tips that you can give that you've been able to conserve water. You wanna go? Should I go? I think you should go, because I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's like, I'm going to about that for a minute. <laughs> um, Tell me. <laughs> uh, I, don't, uh, I don't pour mordants in my dye bath. I pre-mordant my fabric. That's a great way to conserve water. An alum mordant bath will last pretty much forever, just because it's so alkaline. You can just store it and keep adding to it until it, uh, you can kind of see it if it starts to gather too much tannin or, you know, from because I go back and forth between the baths and I rinse them in between, but sometimes tannin accumulates in the alum. Um, but yeah, pre mordant in your fabric, don't pour mordants directly into your dye bath because you're just forcing your dye bath to be something that's hard to deal with, like hard to dispose of properly. You know, you're making it toxic, more toxic than it needs to be. And so that I make um, lakes, you know, pigment lakes out of my out of my sort of like exhausted dye baths. And honestly, like if the dye bath doesn't contain something that is toxic, I compost them. You know, I use them for like, I actually have a test running now with some matter beds and one has sort of like what you'd get compost wise and water wise from a studio and what you'd get from your house from a normal situation. So that's like, I don't know, and sort of like have the different baths ready so that when you're processing things, you go from dirty water to less dirty water to less dirty water. You don't need to throw it out every time. But that's definitely gonna be like the biggest question in the process is that I'm trying to sort of develop is how best to not waste water as much as possible. Because I think we all know how 
much water natural that it takes. Yeah. yeah. Jamie, do you want to add anything onto that or did you come up with anything brilliant while she was talking? <laughs> Um, I think in, in my, my studio practice when I'm dyeing scarves and stuff, I never um, am really trying to get a specific color. I like to just sort of like I'm gonna do this color and do this color and then I'm going to mix these two. So I actually keep my after baths um, in, in jars and I, I will reuse them over and over again uh, until I can't get any more dye out of them. So that's one way. All right. Uh, Deborah Barker is asking, typically we're taught that a more alkaline dye bath is good for deep red matter, but am I reading correctly that both your results are showing the opposite? And have you yeah. had similar results on wool? Um, I do a little after bath of wool and silk just to check, um, which come out orange. I know that that was a question in one of like the emailed questions. Um, but yeah, I just don't think. From the test that I've done, I feel like that it must not be true that like it's because I've heard that too, the alkaline thing. And I think Jamie has as well, that that's like the prevailing sort of. I think idea. it's less alkalinity and more if you mineralize your water, but some of the minerals will actually raise the pH, making it alkaline. Mm -hmm. But like if you put straight soda ash into a matter bath, then you're getting something that's purple. You're not getting a true red. Mm -hmm. And often the higher pH, either a very high pH or a very low pH will kind of really sort of not allow the color to develop on the fiber. I mean, I see that you get a lighter shade actually um, if you alter your pH too much. So um, yeah, I, I sort of was really puzzled when I was working with Cordifolia and we had to use citric acid in order to um, kind of pre-soak it. And I it was like, what? Wait, no. But it worked so great every time. So I just kind of went, okay, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, your testing is really fascinating to see and your uh, what pH levels you're get using. Yeah, I was really confused uh, when I was first sort of realizing that the more alkaline water um, was giving me way lighter um, results. Um, and it sort of convinced me that something else is in the water, um, which it still might be. So I, I'm still exploring and need to do, I think, more tests um, where I try to sort of match what my readings are. Um, in control tests to sort of see if I'm getting similar results, um, which is why that sort of chalk and Mississippi River um, uh, comparison that I showed you guys was so puzzling to me because their values were nearly the same, but um, the results, the dye results were different, so. Yeah. Well, and also like definitely different books. I mean, for my, for my uh, matter process, I use the Lyles book What's it called? It's called Thart and Craft of Natural Dyeing. And he does a lot of traditional recipes. He does like, he includes like a turkey red dye, you know, but he says in it that you're supposed to have a more acidic bath. And when I read that, I was really surprised. And then all these tests sort of ended up that way too. Um, and then I have a book from like the 18th century, this Dyer's Companion. And he talks about how you need like the softest water in the world and to be slightly acidic and I was like okay but then it was exactly what my tests showed like it's better to start with softer water and then adjust the mineral content yourself rather than you know you can't it doesn't really work to say that you have hard water at home and then your matter tests will be great and you don't have to add something because whatever is also in that water is somehow blocking it I'm wondering if like I don't know I'm surprised the Epsom salt thing works so well because I don't know I thought maybe it'd be the mag magnesium in the water that blocks it, but it's not. I don't know why hard water doesn't produce as good a tone in matter. And it kind of makes it oranger regardless of the pH, which I thought was interesting as well. Um, I hope you guys are looking at the chat. A lot of people are writing things that I won't be saying out loud, but some really good information, advice, and just thoughts on what's what is going on so and you know when we have the recording of this later if you don't get to read all the everything in the chat you can watch the recording when i post it 
and and read everything but there's links and again like what betty well, Dave, betty davis best name ever um, <laughs> saying, um, saying about you know environmental racism is like it's this is really what we're talking about here too a part of it well, like what jamie's doing this and having all this you know that parish and industrial build up and and right all the pollution that's there it's because yeah they, they can they can yeah. um the uh, we can actually publish a text file of the chat as well and just include that so that you don't have to scroll through it yourself it, i mean it's not going to be super well formatted but it is there and yeah these are really interesting discussions um mm -hmm. from lorraine and betty yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for all of that info it's yeah. super super informative uh I have a question. So it's for Jamie from Karen Williams. Post dye water question. More curious if matter or the dyeing process affected pollution levels. I don't understand. So Sorry. post it's a post dye post dye water. Okay. Um, did the matter or the dyeing process, maybe any of the any of the whatever you're using as part of your experiment? Did it affect the pollution levels? Were you were you able to measure that or look at that after? Like was um, it altered? I guess. Well, I think well that's if I'm understanding it right. I think that's sort of what my whole um, experiment is about to sort of see if I could detect any of the pollution in the area, and that's why I'm really interested to see what the um, the geology of the area is like. I know it's um, alluvial soils. And um, it does have sort of um, a lot of calcium in the water. And I did recently speak to um, a scientist who told me that the Mississippi River naturally is very alkaline because it has lots of mineral content that's bringing all the way up north, all the way down south. Um, so I'm still sort of trying to um, suss out and figure out what, um, what's sort of happening and what I'm actually even able to detect with matter. Does that answer the question? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I think we're going to take one more question. And thanks to everybody who's posting links to find Sally Fox on Facebook and Instagram and learn more about what's, what's happening. So somebody was, <laughs> every time somebody puts something up, all of a sudden the question disappears <laughs> that I was going to ask. But basically the question was, you know, what are your both, what are your, both of your backgrounds that you're coming to this? Are you textile artist? So you we were kind of talking about this earlier. Are you a scientist? Are you an activist? Like what's your, if you were to call yourself one thing and why you're coming at this project in the way that you are, what would you maybe label yourself as? You can go first, Madeline. Oh. Um, uh, I was a professional textile printer for a while, I guess, since 2012 and um, in Brooklyn, like production textile stuff, you know, yardage, but also t-shirts and things. And um, so I really saw the inside of this sort of like smaller version of the textile industry. Um, and I went to school for fine art for making that was mostly, mostly like lithography and intaglio. I went to RISD up in Providence and um, didn't expect to be a silk screener, but I ended up that way just because that's where I ended up. And I really fell in love with sort of yardage printing. Um, and then later on, I got really interested in natural dyes and anything that can be printed, I'm really interested in. So I forget the second part of the question. Was there a second part? What do we consider ourselves or something? Yeah, like you're going to say, hi, my name is Madeline McGarity and I'm a... Well, I guess a designer textile designer, something like that. Maybe a textile researcher at this point because I don't really do the other thing anymore. But um, also I'd like to say that um, Helen Kennedy in the chat said something about collecting, like um, distilling or distilling water with solar power or something in Arizona and collecting rainwater. That would be, I'd be really interested in that. I don't know if I can get my information to her or something, or she can send me an email, but um, that would be great. Just wanted to say that before I get off. <laughs> but go um, ahead. I consider myself a textile designer illustrator. I got um, a BFA uh, in fibers from SCAD. Um, 
and I, in my studio practice, um, create uh, naturally dyed and printed uh, utilitarian textiles, so mostly scarves, that all, um, the illustrations all sort of tell a story um, about a certain environmental issue happening. Um, so for instance, I have um, one about native pollinators and it comes with um, an essay that I wrote uh, that talks about native pollinators, the human impacts, um, their decline and sort of ends with a list of all the things that we can do to help support those ecosystems. So, and then I'm from Louisiana and um, was trying to figure out how I could use what I love to do and what I, um, what I guess my talents are um, to sort of highlight to the rest of the world what's happening and trying to get people on board to help us um, stop it. Well, thank you so much, the two of you. I like that we were able to take way more questions this time. Woo! We did it. You guys did it. You like chopped down your presentation so you could answer a million questions. And there's yeah. still more questions we didn't get to, but Kathy? But, yes, Kathy? I am. Uh, it's your turn now. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, live here in Seattle. Oh, live wait, that's my from phone. Seattle. Kathy, Kathy. Here. Here's my microphone. Hello, Kathy, everyone. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hey, thanks so much, Jamie and Madeline. That was amazing. Um, I have lots of questions myself, but we'll save it for another chat. And um, Amy will be assembling the video as well as the chat and information. Um, before we open it up, for goodbyes, I just want to talk a little bit about what's coming up. Um, just to remind you that we have one last um, class with Abu Bakar Fofana scheduled, but we've been getting requests for additional classes. And um, unfortunately, uh, Molly just had a, a military coup, and so the border is closed again. He cannot go back to Mali. So at this time, so he is going to stay in Europe. And so I guess that's great for us because we could ask him to do more classes. Mm -hmm. But um, the farm is fine. Everybody on the farm is fine. They're way away from the capital. So um, they're good, but you can't go in and out of the country right now. So he's just going to wait until everything settles down and then he'll be leaving. But until that time, um, we'll see what we can do. Also, Porfirio Gutierrez, who uh, gave a presentation a few weeks back, is doing uh, an in-depth um, study on cochineal using the Zapotec methods of achieving um, a beautiful red through over dyeing. So um, that class is up and we're still taking registrants if you're interested. Uh, we also have a scholarship program with that and you're welcome to apply. Um, and Let's see what else is going on. Those are the two biggies. But for next week, next week, our presenter for our 22nd Feedback Friday is Christine Vejar and Adrian Rodriguez from A Verb for Keeping Warm. Um, those of you who know, they are the dynamic duo behind both a, an Oakland-based um, fiber studio as well as yarn production and natural dyeing. Christine is the author of The Modern Natural Dyer, um, which is a wonderful book that goes through raw materials, extracts, and indigo. So if you are dabbling in all of those worlds, it's a great place to um, look and get information. And it's project-based, so there's projects for a lot of the things that um, you would be interested in. Uh, as well as Christine. Sure could find it. Oh, you know, uh, is it Amazon? <laughs> no, we have it. We're yeah, covered. right. Botanical Colors. Botanical Colors. Right. That place. Botanical Colors carries this book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, just ran out, but we have more coming. I just got a UPS shipping from um, the publisher, so it is on its way in. Um, the other thing is Christine actually has been researching and writing a new book. And it's called Journeys in Natural Dying, and it's published by Abrams, and it'll be out in October. So we will pre-order that book and also have maybe, I guess in October, we're still going to be kind of social distancing. So we'll probably have a virtual book launch or something with um, Adrian and, and um, Christine. So join us next week for that. And without any further ado, we're going to unmute everybody, and you can all say goodbye. 
We're still working on the outro um, theme song, but Amy will have that with it for us soon. Are you I'll, gonna, I'll keep trying to sing something? What'd you say? Are you gonna sing something? Well, it's the end of the week. <laughs> We can just talk over it. Yeah, we're gonna have to. Looping it. Bye, everybody. Bye. Here goes the Bye. dance. Bye. Great. Bye. Thank you. That was the best dance. Great. It was great. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. I don't know how to turn this off now. Hello. Well, Hi. we're Sorry. in it. Bye, and thanks. Are these the outtakes? Oh, this is outtakes with Diane Becker. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Oh, hi, Diane. Oh, hi, Sasha. Oh. Whoa. Hi, It'll keep looping. Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Don't I don't want to, like, no, keep no more. blasting no more. you guys with feedback no Friday, but it is an earworm. It, it is. <laughs> it's terrible. It's like, I can tell when my stress level's going up because I start singing it to myself. It's like, <laughs> Just happy, almost showtime. Yeah, almost showtime. Stop. Bye. Guys. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay. I'm yeah. stopping the recording now. All right. Goodbye. Stop.